you, Alia, and thank you everyone for inviting me. It's truly an honor to be back here at Uber after nine years now. So, this lecture is a discussion on, discussion on how specific or how a specific notion of geometry, standards, and structure within the discipline of architecture needs a situation and aims to have a civic effect. I have categorized my work according to these three categories and reflected upon them in isolation. Although the work is categorized, themes migrate, pollinate between projects, sites, and scales. They rotate, are dissected, curve, and conglomerate, and become something new in other contexts. My work is investigating how mathematics, geometry, and structure engages a specific condition. But it's not pursuing these three topics as a new art part. I'm not pushing new formal manipulations of geometries using new complex notions of mathematics as inspiration for new material production, nor am I pushing a technological agenda or structure. My work is rather pursuing a cultural and public agenda. I'm not necessarily interested in using something on the ambition of the role of being, but rather in configuring of existing conditions with new intentions. I believe in dense directness. I see the clarity and constructive logic, and through the articulation of basic geometries and structure, I see the develop a methodology that allows for both the development of architectural language based on systems and intuition. But it's also a question of politics and civic engagement which drives my work. I believe in the architect as someone who works for the public. Through my self-initiated projects, I have discussed in a literary way geometry, structure, and grid, but also developed thoughts on how the architect can be involved in civic life and politics. The research projects have dealt with, perhaps naively, a dream of modernity, of an architecture in a pure disciplinary form, which is able to merge naively of utopian politics with actual materiality, construction, and language or architecture. My understanding of modernism is as an avant-garde form of art connected to painting, literature, and new radical forms of construction and conceptions of society. I have over the years developed a certain kind of methodology. Usually I work with uh, a basic geometry. I develop organizing lines and work in an iterative process of design. I prefer to layer the projects rather than throw out my view altogether. I quickly establish everything, all the major drawings of the projects, plans, section, elevations, model. I cannot make architecture unless I take the totality of the project into account, rather, and rather update each drawing as they develop. As the projects develop, the original system begins to break down, but there is always traces of the original. The initial grid geometry is sometimes a sponge, sometimes a resistance, and sometimes can provide big problems in the project and lead to a failure, and can be vulnerable to change in the process before the project has reached the point of becoming a language. In the planning of every project, standardized demands such as accessibility toilets, minimum hallway requirements, fire egress rules, natural light regulations, Band inclination rules, environmental rules, are all indisputables, which has to be integrated into the geometric system, or rather gives at a certain point the system uh, a layered, nuanced, and further information. To a certain degree, the process is instruction based, but involves a series of negotiations between the given conditions and idealized geometric forms. This method of working may produce a different kind of type of space, not necessarily studied and developed with spatial qualities in mind, but as a geometric abstract construct, which has in it embedded knowledge. This may in turn lead to space which gives a different type of impression, 
one for the underlying logic here is gradual. So these are certain um, to distill this a little bit further. I would say these are for now the principles of the studio. They, they have been expressed, um, but they're more uh, communicated throughout the project. So architecture is not nature. Architecture is a discipline, and the word should come from and refer to this. Architecture is a cultural practice, not a scientific practice. Work with basic geometries, work with the grid, work with a clear structural idea, repeat, subdivide, rotate, do not conform to the site, be great rather than be invent, develop a system where decisions become self evident, exhaust the original system until it almost breaks down, borrow from previous projects, and use color to add another experiential layer to the project. I've been saying, um, uh, I a lot, but the project has since, uh, in the well, seven years I worked truly in direct collaborations between uh, five other firms, and we have Moshe, and we have Nun, Jürgen Tomba, Ekru, and Jürgen, and a series of uh, assistants in the office, which are mostly for most students. So this talk is divided into three chapters or books if you may, geometry standards as well. And I will present three projects within each of the categories. This is a very recent project uh, done with uh, Rio Pinochet. Uh, it's called Turn and Taste Strange uh, from 2018. This was an exhibition in the existing building uh, outside of Oslo, um, commemorating the 50 year anniversary of this institution, founded by Sonia Henne, uh, an ice skater, um, an entrepreneur, an art collector. And she appeared in uh, many movies, and among them, Alison Morgan. And this became the uh, curatorial. Um, premise set up by um, the curator we work with at the institution. Basically, rearranging um, a really magnificent, magnificent uh, existing collection of work, both in region and, um, and uh, international work, uh, in Picasso and Leo, uh, Oscar Leo, and many other artists. So we were handed um, some also very basic principles to work with. We had to use these two types of walls, which was a prefab system, only at four meters. And we were um, using five different categories uh, of art. And these categories we organized into these geometric shapes, creating some also some kind of resistance to the experience of these things. Then we can go on with them into a um, the structure and collide the different categories into each other so that they lead and create new kinds of um, cross categories in between them. So you would have this one view, for example, through the whole project. And here we, um, we played with a, a section of it using different types of standardized panels and introduced colors for each of the categories, uh, which were closely matched with um, the paintings in this space. This was also uh, built very simply and just using this uh, standardized sheet of panels and the painting was the effect. And the paintings were hung in a vertical manner, almost like in a Johnstone uh, Dodge picture gallery, uh, and chaotically all over uh, the wall. The next project is not one of project, which I'll be mentioning in the introduction. Uh, this was 
for this mission in 2014. Um, we worked on, um, we became interested uh, in the topic from Boas uh, to work with Thomas Meyer, the sort of the often overlooked architect of Bauhaus, and named architect who, who kind of destroyed Bauhaus, uh, not by like means and workers. But we found a lot of his work very interesting. For example, the Bernal School, and particularly his work on the co-op uh, projects of Sibu of Tree and the future projects. And further, as we uh, read more of his work, we read his power manifesto from 1928. And then we found his 12 points for um, basically marking fundamental points of life. And we found them very curious and almost funny to say that this is uh, what life is, this is what living is. So it's sex life, sleeping habits, pets, gardening, personal hygiene, weather protection, hygiene in the home, car maintenance, community, exposure to the sun and services. And further as we read more of his work, we saw perhaps a different side to, to the way he worked. And in particular this quote, which talks about um, his encounters on the building site. I also make an analysis of the building site independently of that building program. My first visits to future building sites are among the most memorable, memorable events in my professional career. The plants, living creatures, and minerals I find there usually tell me more about the characteristics of the place than the people accompanying me. Geobotanic studies are a personal hobby of mine, and I never leave a building site without a botanical cross section in my pocket. Plants are a clear point through the south soil and the conditions of life of any part of Earth's crust. So, given this sort of curious constellation of both uh, radically uh, uh, limiting view on architecture and this more uh, curious uh, pointing, perhaps, encounter with a real site. was sort of the background for our, our project. And then we took each of these points and quite intuitively developed 12 singular architectures for each of the points. Um, so making um, an architecture only of pets, an architecture only of gardening, personal hygiene, cooking, car maintenance, I won't go into it specifically about all the points, um, but we try to interpret them somehow in a new uh, condition. Um, in Fernal, I've also worked with uh, lar larger housing competitions. For example, um, fishing for a uh, area right outside of Oslo called Fornu, which were also kind of guided by strong geometric uh, work. This site used to be an um, airport in Oslo, but it was moved out in the early 2000s. And it has later been developed with uh, large corporations large headquarters, which you see, for example, like this, which has no urban qualities. And our task was to make, um, densify one of these plots here with uh, urban qualities and not suburban qualities. Because now it's, it's kind of like a car, uh, car world out there, where you just drive to your apartment, drive to your headquarters. So we became interested in, in this sort of idea of uh, a city, which was not based on a car, which was based on a different type of urban possibility um, out here. So we studied Camilo Cities, study of medieval plans, and we looked at this kind of incidental 
meeting points between Koi to Ko pieces of our country. And we develop one urban villa, one robust type, which we thought would have um, be the, the nucleus of all development. So this one type would be a um, uh, robust square project, which can be reconfigured in many ways with Atelier Apartments on top. Let's see here. And we also built one row house typology, a four-story uh, row house typology, and then start to meet or configure these pieces into uh, small clusters. And these clusters are these will be raised uh, one meter above ground. So they would create a different zone um, within the larger plan. So here you see a view from up, uh, up on that plateau. And there will be slight variations to all the, the types, but they will remain within the kind of a, uh, one language. And these configurations will create different types of small urban process, small urban spaces. And create kind of tumbled, rotated views, seemingly random from the outside, which would form into the larger plan of the area. Here you see from outside of the building. And how this project fits into the, uh, the larger island, forming a very distinct and different type of uh, urbanism. So, the second chapter, called Standards, could also be called Givens. And this chapter presents a model of the architect, um, perhaps as a stenographer, the one who, who transcribes rather than creates. It's not so much about dimension, but rather intention. And perhaps this architect works on production of collective meaning through a seemingly effortless, automated approach and finds beauty and order and studies simplicity, administrative art and bureaucratic answers to societal problems. And in turn, this effortless mode of engaging with the world can perhaps create a new form of architectural production. And this author is both an architect as producer and curator who maneuvers traditions and technology. One friend of this thought can be found in Robert Musso in his book The Man Without Politics. Um, I find this part of uh, uh, The Man Without Politics particularly interesting and I'll read from this section. He was in a familiar state of incoherent ideas spreading outward without the center, so characteristic of the present, and whose strange arithmetic adds up to a random proliferation of numbers without forming a unit. Finally, he dreamed up only in practical rooms, revolving rooms, telescopic rooms, adjustable scenery for the soul, and his ideas grew steadily more devoid of content. For man's possibilities, plans and feelings must be hedged in by prejudice, tradition, obstacles and barriers of source, like a lunatic and straightjacket. And only then can whatever is capable of doing have perhaps some value, substance and staying power. Here, in fact, was an idea of incalculable implications. So this speaks about the protagonist as his the, uh, considering decorating his apartment and and there's a sort of a crisis where he can only dream up all these different things and at the end just gives it all to the supplier. 
So it gives, takes away all judgment and gives all the decisions away. One artist I, um, I really appreciate is the work of Wayne Kai, whose paintbrush is the Epson um, plotter. And his work is uh, a focal piece of canvas and he uses, uh, he plots out basically word documents that are black in the next on it. And then it creates these random uh, moments on the canvas. So this project, first of all, you didn't hear it from me, you didn't hear this from me, was the project I did um, right um, after graduating from Cooper and working one year for a large office. And I've never done a project on my own before without having a professor um, or a uh, boss. So this was kind of an important project to find my practice at that point. So I started to teach and this was the first project I did. And the project is a series of drawings and text which um, is a narrative about a new global architecture agency which sets out to take over uh, control of architecture. It is not the crisis of architecture or the problem of iconic architecture that is the reason why the agency will change this point. No, for the agency, the icon did not enter into the crisis that already disappeared from the panorama of their considerations. Someone told me it's a global architecture agency, a multinational organization run by a group of appointed technocrats that is about to put architecture under strict control. The plan of the agency is to standardize the entire body of architecture to ban any form of architecture competition and to reorganize the economic condition in which architecture is produced. New materials and performance enhancement of existing materials is very important to the agency. A part of the agency's task is to deal with the atrocities of past architecture. A court is established with judges and a legal system that begins the incredible job of prosecuting mm -hmm. architects, politicians, developers, and cities for their misdeeds during the past 50 or so decades. Architects will produce systems, political resolutions, manage extremely complex sets of data based on user requests, and find the most effect effective way of shipping and assembling architecture at the number of publications. The leaders of the agency will give proclamations every week about the state of architecture. The leaders give no explanation, no excuses, they do not feel the need to be understood and provide any concepts. They only lay out indisputable facts. The next project is uh, a competition I did with uh, Gabi Tampai, which we won in uh, 2014. It's a part of uh, the National Tourist Route project in Norway. Um, consists of making small viewing platforms in scenic nature and providing simple uh, infrastructure like toilets and places to rest uh, safely next to highly traffic roads. So our, our project started with trying to define our understanding of nature. So for Galileo, through his telescopes and compasses in the 17th century, was thinking about nature as an infinite system of mathematical formulas. As a result of this, nature became a system for experimental physics in an internal speculative expansion of context. Later on, the idea of nature experienced a rupture the rupture promoted by an alternative idea in the 18th century German romantic literature and painting. One understanding of nature 
where nature itself is the poem. As, um, these, two, these two understandings, nature, we thought were very interesting. And we sort of want to situate our, our project in between understanding of nature as an infinite system or nature as the sublime. Further, we also became interested, uh, of course, in, in the land urban movement in the 60s. And these projects represent um, a tension between sight and non sight, between natural and the artificial, and between the human present and the vast expanses of geological time. So, as Rosalind Krauss writes in her book, The Originality of the Old God and Other Modernist Myths, the definition of this project is expressed through negativity, not landscape, not architecture, and creates an ontological absence, world making, not natural, in opposition to landscape. But one can imagine that something could be both landscape and architecture, in other words, a complex. The expanded field is where these terms architecture and sculpture are problematized. This was the backdrop, and um, our site was located in the very north of Norway, in this incredibly scenic um, nature. The view uh, which most people stopped here for was this view out um, to the ocean, and also to this very special island here, which has a very active and live fishing community. Still. This view is obvious, uh, but also if you turn uh, around, you see this mountain. And you see this um, also incredible, uh, quite a beautiful part of nature that most people do not see. So we began this project by having an extremely detailed um, 3D scan of the whole site down to 5 centimeter total lines, which would give us everything also from the bushes down to the soil, and they do this kind of almost like an ocean where they find where the soft and the hard part of the land is. And we used, developed some sort of premises for the whole project. So premise one was to follow the stair from one. We have this yes. It's interesting because they're you almost have them everywhere, but they're always slightly different. Uh, so it's almost universal uh, rule, but very slow. So it's this part of where you have a certain kind of leeway uh, in developing step. So we want to use this bureaucratic uh, given rule. And not one was that every three meter rise there needs to be a landing. There needs to be guardrail if it's more than 0.9 meters of terrain. Mm -hmm. The landscape um, has a 20 year, if you, if you kick the land in the dirt, it takes 20 years for that soil, mm -hmm. for that grass to grow back. So any mark on the landscape is, um, is uh, extremely consequential. It's almost like a desert where it's also very scarce. And within these rules, follow the terrain as much as possible. So our project describes this kind of rectangular geometry, which is based on certain topographic uh, givens on the site. So here's a little ridge that many walked around, walked out to. And then here is a very uh, a nice slope path going up into further paths into nature here. And then there's the ravine, uh, which we also kind of took into our project. But the whole project is slightly skewed from these elements, creating in plan um, attention to the landscape, not conforming completely and not 
uh, but also still abiding to some certain kind of movement patterns existing. We have seen the part of the plan. And then the plan plus these four mentioned rules generates a sectional condition instead. At the tip of the stair, it takes the level of the road and gives an accessibility um, out here um, for those who don't walk in stairs. And some of the effects of all these which creates this kind of random, seemingly random effects where the guardrail breaks open at certain points, which is also the point where you can go out into the landscape because it's safe to, to drop down those effects. This is the bridge, or what hovers above the landscape, and then the entrance condition. Condition, which is completely lost. The whole project um, is made from um, old plastic grates, which is used in the oil industry program, and it's all co um, colored in uh, it's what we call it, cobalt blue, which was a uh, very sp specific type of paint in that in the 18th century Norway used a lot for romantic paintings romantic at that time. And here you see uh, the whole project was made in sections. So they will be made in, in six meter long sections and helicopter into the site, uh, into very few pre-drilled uh, punctuations in the landscape. So everything will be made in off-site, in the factory, and shipped in. And there will be one bench um, which we want to kind of make longer than the normal bench so it took on a different proportion than a um, typical uh, bench in this type of these two school projects. And then with the uh, uh, plastic grates on top of the steel structure. So this project was detailed um, out to shop joints for the steel and sent out for it. Here's the view on the, on the bench, also just attached to the main structure. The whole project is made from very limited amount of uh, standardized steel profiles, just four, four profiles. And even the, the uh, sort of exceptional elements like the bench and, and this entrance info sign is uh, also a standard sheet of steel just rolled, um, uh, rolled so you have the protection. This project is currently on hold because uh, after we sent out everything we did and we received good documents, um, someone planned a huge hotel here, which would take away our entire view. So our client is uh, waiting to see that this bit. <laughs> we worked four years on that. The next project is for the same client. Um, this is a service and surf building in the north of Norway. Um, it is uh, just a tiny bit south from the last project. Uh, really beautiful uh, roof wood in uh, which is very popular for surfers and hikers. And you see this, uh, this beach. Our 
site will be located right behind where the statue is located. Very similar type of conditions. We worked on um, to establish this grid of six meter by six meter, and then we produced a series of operations on this, uh, this square. So we diagonally divided it to give the largest surface to the view. We cut holes uh, at certain points to the right of the plan. We placed all the heavy program in the back and allowed for a large restaurant uh, service area in front. We developed a beam system which would be broken down and then we would uh, have this uh, cruciform uh, columns. And then at the end, uh, given the kind of negotiation of these different actors, we have up with this plan as the structural plan. this as the final plan. The structure, the structure is the, the heaviest walls. We thought of this project almost like uh, as an apparatus, and we situated in, um, in some diagrams in order to strategically place the windows and uh, the apertures. In the and here's the final project that has. Uh, Surf storage, it has uh, restrooms, kitchen, and staff area, and a staff room. And this is the larger uh, restaurant area. We, what we kind of looked at, um, we looked at the meal section and we're kind of uh, balance piano because we want to have this, this very strong, uh, very large uh, concrete beams in the ceiling. And then when you have to introduce all the ventilation and all the systems, um, kind of, uh, we're disappointed. So we developed a very technical uh, floor and then we would bring up the air and the light through these large walls and they would stop here and then that would keep this ceiling completely clean. You see here the axiometry also uh, that these are the walls that contain both the structure and the technical systems in the building. And then there, there's these steel brackets uh, that's pin connected. Um, to the electric beam system. And in the back, it has a perforated um, steel panels. It's important for us to, since this will be basically not used for six months of the year, that it would be possible to sit sort of in shelter behind these walls so it would feel uh, somehow intimate even if the space was um, quite empty. And the attempt of uh, a vehicle, which was part of the competition station with this uh, forum. The next and the last chapter um, we discuss uh, certain other of my projects which deal more explicitly with structure. And some of the research developed in regards to this has been done in my studios uh, at Oscar School of Architecture, where we looked at Chicago School. And in particular, 
Singer, Colin Rose, writing in the Chicago Frame. And he describes uh, the Chicago School, um, which is very interesting. He says it's a combination of a ruthless open-mindedness and imaginative salesmanship. So, on Sullivan's admissions, the architects of Chicago did not demand the frame. It was rather presented to them. And this, sim and this simple fact may explain both the rapid and dispassionate manner in which they contrived to rationalize the frame structure and also the way in which so many of them were able to abandon the method for another and different one. Colin Rowe describes um, the difference between the Corbusier's understanding of the frame and the Chicago architect's understanding of the frame. One being highly ideological, the other one being dispassionate and accepting of certain given conditions. And he says both, uh, both like the other. If one likes poetry, the other likes prose. And he describes the difference between Burnham and his uh, as employee in this type of uh, conditions for the difference in language. So the nice to do we, we study these buildings and uh, for example we like the Rome building, uh, which is one of the first, this is still cast iron structure, very, very deep plan, really beautiful, with all the services and the edges. The Sullivan Theatre since demolished, and then the People's Gas Building from 1911, which was the first one to start to use steel basin. And the, uh, I'm still fascinated by the incredible invention of all these uh, articles, both in terms of the technical systems, but also the architectural imaginations. And all this kind of layered steel structure um, to the, because they never used bracing, so all the conditions have been really stiff and created this incredibly ornate uh, joints. And of course, everything is covered up uh, with plaster and that type of material. Yeah. Similarly, um, I became interested in um, the literalist artist of the 60s and 70s, Anne Turit, for example, and in particular Mark Ginder, his book Nothing Less Than Literal, which embodies to a certain degree a similar um, attitude, although in a more active way than um, as the Chicago art was. So he defined uh, the literalist artist, Donald Jake, and Triers, and Carl Andre. One concise definition of literalism is representation without idealization. This is, this is the axiom of literalism. Literalism locates the turning point, in this case the is, when language or representation seems entirely adequate and direct, but also utterly inflexible and not in the in the terms. And there's a column of this, the this. Our project, Slow Down Studios, um, from 2014. It's a very rapid project. Um, we were given, given a site and or an existing site and we had four months from the started till the project should be done. And this was the way the film industry works. They were extremely intensive and they prefer to do it this way. So we started to look at um, the Inabu uh, for example, her theater in Sao Paulo, which is all made from scaffolding pieces inside an existing building. And also Robert Wilson's stage sets, which um, also creates some kind of um, 
impromptu world. This project was for the, um, uh, basically the camera department of a large um, company in Norway. And this was the site we were given. And the lease is 10 years, so part of the brief was to only to make a structure which could be taken down. That we made very quickly, and it should be uh, perhaps taken down in a few years. Another premise of the project was that everything had to go through this window, 70 by 150 centimeters. So we developed so the catalog of elements, uh, new profiles, wood joints, HEP profiles, all profiles, and flat steel. And this became a kind of vocabulary for the project, which then in turn would be bolted together, maybe, apart from a few, basically the project is all bolted, apart from a few very strategic uh, wells. So what we decided to do was to divide the space in half, um, and then this would be the checkout area where they would calibrate cameras. And this would be the back part with many different functions for that company. And it would all be inserted um, into the structure and also provide very varying degrees of security for the very, very expensive cameras. This would be the kind of um, screen uh, which all would have sliding panels and different degrees of transparency painted uh, in different colors um, behind each of the uh, functions in the back providing different types of um, atmospheres during the day is quite simple. It's this open space here where they calibrate the cameras before they go out on shoots. It's a cinema that's used for directors to check movies before they're sent to the, the major cinemas. It's a reception area and it's uh, uh, camera repair areas. And then a very secure server area for the system and for service and most expensive. And also a mezzanine level, which has an office space, and then a bridge um, looking out of the space. Here you see the front inside, um, the staff quarters. And in addition to the steel, it also had to have a series of wall types, which had to do with insulation. And it's basically sound insulation. So depending on how sound and soundproof you need to be, you need to have a wider gap in the uh, Here you see from the uh, camera calibration area. And that's this in storage units. And then another uh, competition I recently submitted was a competition in Central Park of Norway for a museum of forest film culture. And the um, forest film, forest films in Norway were a indigenous group that lived in Norway in the 18th century. And then slowly has been They work on a very special type of agriculture, which is a scorched earth agriculture. So they would burn large crops of land and um, grow new crops in a very efficient way of um, giving way of actually running the earth. And they would have these very loose kind of settlements. Um, 
So the project takes on, it's located right next to the river here, yeah. and it encapsulates and creates water space. So a nice in with the, the most say close of parts in the seal here for the MC staff, more public part, and then a pure exhibition pavilion in the front, which is cantilever or hovering about reaching about that. And has this the sectional conditions. And the public area here with a highway section thing. Courtyard space and then the, the gallery space, the space in the front, the castle comes up with a kind of green structure, resting on the four concrete walls. One of the courtyards is open, has no vegetation. Part of the surface and the inner more private courtyard um, as a small forest. The structure is um, used these kind of very simple wooden trusses that span almost like a barn like large space uh, where we see functions of it. Last project, uh, I don't know how long I've been going. It's, uh, it's actually an ongoing project, um, so I'm, I'm not completely sure about it yet. I'm still in development. But it's a, it's a very beautiful existing building in a small town in Norway that used to be. Uh, Seal School and is now uh, turned into a museum. It's done by Yannick uh, Eliasson, which is in the office. It's an uh, early 20th century architect. It's sort of like the hospital of Seal in Norway. Very robust, very heavy architecture. And they had a certain kind of tropes they, they used. For example, they would always slightly land uh, the roof line. They would work on very large proportions. And they would have, within all this robustness, they would have a certain kind of elegance to all their project. There will be one slight detail, and then they work with sculptor and use these characters uh, to line the whole building around. It's located on a hill in Norway. Um, it's sort of like each each town. You should say it's like my own here. Um, so, People go there to go to the beach, not necessarily to go to the museum. So this is part of the possible condition of the museum, just to expand it and give it some more attention. The task is to put all the public functions of the museum into this courtyard and create a new roof uh, for the space. Our approach to this is going to introduce a new structure which is not touching the existing building and therefore not touching the 
existing very, very large foundations is really stuck in. And also makes the building completely dependent of the other of the system. And therefore uh, reversible, which is an important part of the preservation of all this mission. And then within that gap of uh, new structure, the old structure, we placed uh, a pay, circulation, reception, and store. And then allowed for a large uh, flexible space for openings and performances. And on the second floor, um, we connected two parts to create a roof of all you see, which is kind of important for the circulation. So you don't have to turn around and also come to that. We received a plan where the whole existing building is returned to a pure uh, museum space. And this would be a quite active courtyard. And there will be a colonnade under, underneath uh, the bridging element. In this bridging element, um, you can pass by and go around, or you can take the kind of the rest and look down uh, on this group, on this second table. This, um, in this structure, we, we kind of want to, to take some of the cues from the existing building and develop a new type of structure based on that. So we use this, um, this kind of curved structure uh, to span the core space. And you see a sketch of how this front of the bridging element would be. It's quite independent from the existing structure. And we added some few elements that just came into the language of the system building. And here you see the last slide where we see the bridge, and then we use the structure. So we're working, this is currently in progress, and we're working. Working on it now, just to have assistance. So that's it. Thank you very much.
this And then I began to wonder, in an era where the imaging of architecture is so highly refined, and the kind of potential foibles of the interruption of the project, like your four-year project for um, the stair on the site, which was then totally circumvented by the development of the project in Sushit. With imaging so incredibly realistic, is it necessary to actually take a project to a 2 day bit? Or as an architect, as a young architect,
take these rules and these givens and, and exhaust them or work on them until, until they produce a different type of effect. And sometimes that's working on, on them until they or it's to turn it around at some point. For example, in stair, where we have using all these kind of rational rules, um, we came to it in this uh, 18th century, uh, which refers back to a different type of uh, So if this was done by the Lord's apartment, it might have done stair. It's almost like that. But just a few changes. So I think that's uh, that's the kind of really part. Really, the reiteration. Or yeah, yeah, putting things together in a different way, or being uh, so I smile. Say that just like I said in your but maybe in the sense that like after you do the procedures, like it's bizarre or odd or like that. in a way that you kind of don't like. Well, I think um, the last project, perhaps because it has it wasn't as as stringent. And I think what's different in this last project is that it's also mixing in a historical mod, which I'm, I'm not comfortable with because, because that doesn't kind of fit into the equation. That's an interpretation. Or that he messes in this. In this, uh, this is hard to. Inscribe into the whole system. But I think in this, this case it's, uh, it's still a little bit of the other one. So I but perhaps you were you sensing? Okay. You're not on the project where it didn't quite add up. No, I mean, I, I feel I feel like everyone should ask this question in any, any lecture, uh, especially as students. It's, I think more instructive for students. Um, no, I mean, definitely, it definitely breaks down. But but I, I'm just comfortable asking you because we know each other. Uh, no, the one that struck me is the one was. was the surf shack, uh, but that was where, I mean, in a way it follows the logic, it just seems so, uh, uh, it so much a procedure in different places, but particularly the way it might be the CCO and uh, the kind of image of it is so much. Uh, of a certain kind of the 60s, 70s, steel, uh, like on the SLM. But I don't know if it's necessarily a unique on your own terms, but, well, I didn't like that project. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just curious to hear you talk about that, but you are the Um, I was just you know, in the end, you know, for instance, introducing the sets, but how are they introduced in certain ways that introduce the sets, and then on the part of the site, where they're in the same set. It's never, um, they never start. They never start with the sets, and then you should not maybe they become clear various points in the process. But for example, starting with a clear geometry, it's 
almost like you have to uh, act. So, you be squared or you be circled. It's not necessarily specific at that point. It's an intuition of somehow working with a clear geometry to begin with. And then that geometry absorbs the different conditions in the project. And it becomes a sort of layered and intricate. And then the rules start to kind of merge. It's, it's never as linear, but if I just kind of sketch out the process, that's usually what happens. Are you broken the rules after you figure Not explicitly broken, but maybe come to a point where uh, it has to be altered or it just doesn't work. Well, I guess that's great. It just doesn't work, so you have to, you have to do something else and then you go across the way. Yeah. Or it's it's 
uh, the site the effect of the site is either not shown in the drawing or at least in film best by the audience uh, through the thing. But it's, it's the specific problem that you know that the Promenade staircase along the uh, the landscape that you're supposed to protect within those rules, that's where the idea of geometry and size of paint is When I look at the lines of perfect uh, stainless rectangle, when you look at the section, everything seems uh, destructive. So the plan seems to be the last bastion of platonic geometry. And the question is, at that point, does platonic geometry in that environment matter? So if you stretch that rectangle to a different geometric shape, or it's not geometric at all, it's organic, will that work for you? So, what, so the question just goes back to the very original idea of if sometimes the site, according to building codes or according to the regulation codes, you're not able to escape your resistance, you have to conform to it. Um, then what ultimately is your motivation of using the common geometry? Is that constructability? Is that a visual language? Even when it's constructed? When looking at perspective, no one see that as a rectangle? Or is it because there is a certain ideological principle that you're working with that you prefer to do? Well, um, I think there's two all fantastic two, two parts, but I think it's, it's maybe it's a little bit of provocation. It's conforming to the site, not conforming to the site. Um, you know, certain ethos in Norwegian architecture always something the site to the site. So uh, I think we set out as a program to challenge this notion that we should always Do oneself to the conditions of the site. And then, if it doesn't matter, the geometry. Uh, well, I think to a certain degree, uh, although one might not experience the totality of the geometry, I think somehow you discover it uh, in a different way than if it was all conservative. And, uh, that being in the maybe So I think the effect of the sort of tension between uh, being quite natural on site, but also having some sort of resistance would create uh, friction, which would give a different type of uh, experience in nature. I think that was part of our mission. Both kind of a romantic discovery of what nature, but it's also kind of a measure. So there's a kind of a duality you will see, and it wouldn't be completely apparent uh, to the viewer at uh, first sight, but it would be discovered. Because it does, even if it doesn't look like it, it 
because we are using the southern energy way out of different uh, tracks or trails, and also it can direct you towards the use, the uh, sample use of that, which you normally wouldn't start to look at. That was the case that part of the intention of not just creating something that has a singular So I think that's at least our ambition was that it would be able to other factors in the larger site. And there was not a specific site uh, determination. Okay. Uh, it's not like that is the
and this the, the narrative is certainly an undisturbing narrative. It's not necessarily manifesto for for my office. Right. So do you think the metric for to um, quantify the receiving effect that you were designing the contribution part or um is it the vision mindset and the value like
part of her thing. So as, as a person now in the place of the words, not so long ago, uh, now in the room of students, if you were to give them any advice, knowing what you know now that you didn't know then, that means to and so you learn. No, I think 